So, well, um, I will ask you some questions today about familiar topics like digital transformation, mm -hmm. but also if that's okay with you, um, I was reading some of your previous interviews and I found some topics quite interesting and I wanted to ask you a bit more about those and some of your experiences. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, ask me anything. If I don't know, I just say I don't know. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you mentioned uh, that you want to reuse uh, some of those materials. It's all under CC attribution license. So as long as you, uh, you know, give a link to the original URL somehow, you're, it's all free uh, for you to use. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. It's always uh, good to ask so that you know what's being done with the data, I guess. Yes. Okay. So. Um, just to start off on, on familiar ground, I think um, intelligent automation and digital transformation are becoming increasingly more apparent on the global agenda. A lot of people are talking about it um, in private companies, the public sector increasingly, as you know, and also in the social sector. Sure. When we look at Taiwan, there seems to be quite a unique way of approaching digital transformation. We see collaboration with the social sector more. Um, as you said as well, there's trust in the public from the government in the first instance to start with. And also there's a lot of knowledge when it comes to technology itself through, through the background that you have and some of the specialists that work with you. Um, can you tell me a bit more about that and why Taiwan is so unique in a way in its approach? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I don't I don't think Taiwan is particularly unique unique because we also learn from our, our international counterparts. We learn from the uh, civic tech communities. For example, we collaborate regularly with Code for Japan, uh, which is a, a GovZero like community in Japan, and also South Korea. Uh, the community here have run hackathons in Okinawa, which is the midpoint between the South Korea and Japan and Taiwanese communities, uh, being a kind of midpoint island with its own culture and civilization uh, adapts. And so um, I think we're part of this larger ecosystem of civic technologists. I think the unique thing, if uh, any, in Taiwan is that we see democracy itself as a social technology that you can also tinker, that you can also innovate. And I think that's because we don't have a long tradition uh, of democracy. We literally fought for democracy. Uh, my parents' generation, grandparents' generation fought for it so that our generation, uh, we are uh, in our 30s, are the first generation that can uh, grow up with uh, the freedom of expression of the press and so on. So for all of us, this is all very new. And because it's very new, uh, we learned to build democracy when there's already World Wide Web, when there is already the internet-based technologies. So we're not limited by the traditional um, customs uh, or norms around uh, physical uh, physics technologies. Uh, that is to say, uh, the attenuation of sound in a large town hall limits the number of people who can speak and listen at the same time. We start off with the technology that enable millions of people to listen at one another deeply. And that, I think, formed a more participatory culture of everybody who think about how to uh, make the democracy better can just, you know, uh, contribute and make democracy better. They don't have to wait for a representative to represent them. Okay. Um, and just to sort of set that in time, uh, would that have been round about the 90s when the Wild Lily movement happened? That's exactly right. Before okay. which there, there was still martial law, right? Uh, the martial law extended all the way to the late 80s, and we did not have the first presidential election until 1996. Um, and so there was um, a decade of uh, grassroots movement, um, community as a practice, the social sector building the legitimacy until uh, the presidential election, where the election started to come uh, by the um, you know president uh, themselves uh, and the premier that they appoint. But always the social sector has had higher legitimacy and still enjoy higher legitimacy than our administration. Okay, I find that quite interesting. So I'm originally from Romania, ah, mm -hmm. and Romania had um, a revolution in 1989 where it switched from um, a communist regime to a democracy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, it's quite interesting because in, in Romania, the switch was quite sudden in a way, and the 
technologies that perhaps were in place in Taiwan and developing didn't have an incubation phase, if you will. Mm -hmm. So for me, as a Romanian national, it's quite interesting to sort of look at the, the lack of the incubation phase versus mm -hmm. having the incubation phase and how that developed the right, social right, right. sector. In, in Taiwan, there was no revolution to, to speak mm -hmm. of. It's an evolution. It's a peaceful, mm -hmm. uh, calm revolution, if you will, uh, that mm -hmm. did not end in bloodshed in any kind. And this is, uh, I think, really informed our, uh, I call it a transculturalism. That is to say, there's more than 20 national languages in Taiwan and uh, no one dominates the other ones and people kind of uh, live in a live and let live kind of way because there was no revolutions uh, during our democratization. Yes, I was reading about that a bit and it seems, as you say, that there was an evolution and that the values that people had towards free speech, culture and the importance of the social sector almost organically fell into place in a way. Um, even though there were movements proposing changes, there was also a, re a reception for them. There was also an open-mindedness to them. Right. Okay, so you agree. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I've done my reading. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Excellent <laughs> research. <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask you actually um, what your opinion is on the form that took as the sunflower movement happened. Mm -hmm. sure. I found. Um, a paragraph from an interview quite interesting where you were describing um, that technology was actively used to create an intra network of people mm -hmm. being present yeah. there and um, that that seems as though technology had a more significant impact than mm -hmm. than before can you tell me a bit more about definitely, that definitely definitely but but uh, first of all i would say that the digital technology was mm -hmm. purely a assistive role uh, role in the sunflower occupy mostly it's social technology that is to say uh, for example the daily um, broadcasted uh, readings of previous days consensus and the uh, political responses from all the stakeholder groups in the occupied parliament by the student leaders uh, that's like a, a ritual uh, that uh, that they do uh, every morning or the physical placement of the 20 or so NGOs around the occupied parliament, uh, including uh, the three neutrals, right? The people who are there to protect the uh, do uh, human rights, uh, the, the uh, pro bono lawyers and uh, the people who are there, the pro bono medical staff to protect uh, everybody's health, as well as the communication experts, including uh, but not limited to the e forum or the Gov Zero and so on, uh, that are there to protect everybody's uh, right to communication. Uh, and these are uh, the kind of fabric that weaves a open space uh, in which that people can freely deliberate all the different aspects of the cross-trade service trade agreement or the CSSTA. Unlike many other occupiers where lack a single focal point, uh, the Sunflower is very focused on the CSSTA and its social impact. So uh, after three weeks, there was a set of very firm consensus uh, for demand, no, not one less. Uh, and the head of the MP eventually agreed on those four demands. So the Occupy was a success and it was a demonstration that shows people that it is possible with the recommendation of social technology, facilitation and deliberation for half a million people on the street and many more online to agree in a rough consensus about a very large uh, CSSDA agreement as scope. And so I think that's why the cabinet then decided to learn this art of facilitated listening skill rather than seeing the protesters as purely protesters, they see it as a demo, people who demonstrate a newer way of policy making. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that there wasn't the othering that you see mm -hmm. happening with so many exactly. other Exactly. Yeah. Excellent interpretation. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. With mm -hmm. so many, with so many other movements. Mm -hmm. Also, um, when you were mentioning the fact that there were 20 NGOs involved and different stakeholders, that sounds like there was quite a complex approach there. Did mm -hmm. this evolve from the previous yes. events? Yes. So it was informed uh, by many other events, uh, the wild strawberry, the wild lily. Uh, it's always wild something. I wonder why it's not called wild sunflower, maybe too many uh, you know, syllables. But anyway, so, um, well, sunflowers are already wild anyway. So it, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, it's a network of uh, 
practice uh, communities that each of those NGOs um, all have, um, as I said, um, in the, since the late 80s when they started building legitimacy. So each of them have their own network of uh, people who care about such aspects. So to, to talk about uh, the impact of CSST on cybersecurity, on human rights violations, on labor conditions, on uh, environmental protection, on freedom of the press, and so on, each have its own NGO to take care of that particular aspect. And so yes, it is a, a large network of communications. And uh, for Sunflower Movement, it's just that uh, it uh, uh, like a um, rolling uh, snowball <laughs> uh, gets much more uh, people who are just part-time uh, um, involvement, not full-time dedicated social movement people uh, to get into the habit of listening to those different NGOs. But uh, the root of the solidarity is already there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when would you say that the root of solidarity became part of Taiwanese culture is it thousands of years old can you tell can you identify something that's that's related to it yeah sure uh, well if you want to go way back of course um the out of taiwan uh, hypothesis says that the whole polynesian austronesian uh, culture uh, was from the taiwanese uh, indigenous people uh, and indeed many of those uh, cultures are still around and even people uh, who are from new zealand like the maori uh, still visit Taiwan to uh, celebrate their shared uh, cultural identity. And so that part has always been a part of Taiwan. Um, and because uh, Taiwan is uh, layers upon layers of cultures, of waves of waves of uh, immigrations, uh, it's by necessity that people rely on social sector instead of a large uh, you know, federal government of sorts, because uh, we're um, a bunch of islands and any nearest continent is actually quite far away uh, with no advantage seafaring technology and so people um, relied on each other much more there's already uh, many uh, prototypes of co-op like movement um, in Taiwan so even after uh, the end of the Japanese colonial rule uh, there's uh, still a lot of social fabric that connects those co-op like structures uh, together and although many of them uh, did get suppressed during the Chiang Kai-shek nationalist uh, uh, rule uh, it was still uh, I would say that the credit union movement, the co-op movement, the other movement still have a very firm um, 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 share of mind, uh, for lack of a better term, in the ordinary Taiwanese citizens who uh, do not, uh, frankly speaking, trust that much uh, any bureaucratic structure. Okay, um, so there are some technology theorists that state that technology amplifies some of the social values and norms of the people creating the technology and designing mm -hmm. that technology. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a bit more about your thoughts on that? Sure. So um, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we insist that uh, broadband access is a human right. And behind that uh, was uh, the uh, decades of policy that basically says that whenever we roll out new communication infrastructure, we need to begin in the lowest resource places. That is to say, there's a very strong egalitarian uh, approach when it comes to healthcare, which is single payer and universal coverage, and education. These two areas, Taiwanese people believe uh, in the uh, not only equal opportunity, but actually all the newest um, ideas are to be prototyped in the places that are suffering the most, empowering people closest to the pain. Um, and this is, uh, I think, a very long tradition. Uh, uh, certainly before my before I was born, uh, that people have already considered this way of thinking. Um, partly that was because the constitution of the current um, uh, governments in Taiwan came from Dr. Sun Yat-sen, uh, who is a student uh, of uh, thought leaders like Henry George, uh, who is a social thinker that is neither left or right, right? Uh, the Georgist school believes in using the market in a pro-social manner, so that while maximizing people's individual preferences, it it also enabled the social technologists to design mechanism that furthers everybody else's uh, maximal um, welfare. And, and this 
uh, mechanism design school of thought uh, is written uh, in the constitution and it um, specifically said uh, that uh, co-op like structures uh, are to be encouraged in a mechanism design uh, thinking need to be applied to for example collective ownership of land and things like that to maximize its use by market mechanism while feedbacking uh, the uh, social preferences uh, to the how people allocate their um, thoughts and things like that their votes and things like that and so uh, we introduce novel ways of decision making almost as part of our culture when there's a new voting system like quadratic voting we just apply it directly to our presidential hackathon and you can see the same with participatory budgeting and many other people's um, democracy uh, new thoughts and new mechanisms okay that's very interesting so um, there are some some views on technology as being let's say critical realist where technology is objective and we um, we have our own personal experience that that shapes how we see technology and there um, are also some emerging trends in the West that look at post-humanist technology if you will where the individual is no longer the center of the discussion and so some of the questions arising from that are over time how does technology shape the uh, individual if you will so with the context you've just described how how do you think that happens well, soap is a technology, right? Uh, and, and that is uh, what we rely on nowadays. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, voting is a technology. Well, writing systems are technologies. So uh, the human civilization has been defined by technologies, and it's not a new thing. What is a new thing is that the uh, human condition uh, is now increasingly being shaped by those technologies that re present ourselves, that we are essentially avatars. I mean, I'm not really talking to you in the flesh, I'm talking to a two-dimensional uh, representation of you. Uh, and, and this uh, really uh, makes it uh, much harder for each individual uh, to have a good kind of bargaining power or even a sense of bargaining power. This is like a on the cusp of uh, the industrialization where individual workers have no way to negotiate with the capitalist on the working conditions because individually they are have much less political power and financial power and other mobilization power. It's not until the invention of cooperatives and unions uh, do the workers now have a way both legally and part of the social norm uh, to uh, negotiate uh, as a social sector. And so what we are now seeing uh, very similar things is happening uh, in controllership uh, over data, uh, in personal data protection, in privacy, uh, in uh, getting a accountable um, reading of the decision that affects us and things like that. And the more that people insist on the social sector norms, the more the technologists like us will develop in a pro-social way and the less people are insisting on on those norms and then uh, of course the surveillance state or the surveillance uh, capitalism will then uh, just harvest uh, people's uh, data if not um, other parts yeah. okay so um, there there are uh, a few elements in there and I'm trying to think of which one to start with um, <laughs> yes <laughs> so for example, what comes to mind as I listen to you is um, the difference in between some of the approaches we've seen um, in Taiwan, where we have uh, trust from the government first into citizens and working from the low level, uh, level first to the immediate yes. experience we have now um, in parts of the West, where we have the concept of digital participation and bringing that from governments from public sector authorities to citizens it seems as though there is more of an evolution towards uh, participation and the social sector as well but it can take a while to actually get there do you see a bridge or steps that can be taken to bridge that gap definitely i mean um the uh, rapid responses that we're now seeing uh, because of coronavirus of the daily press briefings, that's a really good start. If you add a daily press briefing through live stream and working with the journalists uh, with a hotline that everybody can call if they have something new, um, idea to contribute, that's using just very uh, ancient technology. That's just radio, television, and telephone. But, but with that, 
you can build a rapid response system that makes uh, the trust to the citizens apparent that um, any new idea just become a policy that gets amplified to the society. And we see many, um, because of coronavirus, many jurisdictions start taking this really into account and expanding their call centers as well as um, you know nationalizing some parts of the broadcasting channels uh, for those sort of communications. And this is just a, a social innovation that's very old, using very old technology, but that uh, demonstratively um, adds people's willingness to participate in the counter coronavirus ways. Of course, we see mask for all, where people are uh, shown how to, you know, use, reuse their T-shirts and things like that to to weave their own mask uh, and to uh, remind themselves not to touch their face and wash their hands properly. Again, that's social technology, um, and so all of this, I think, because because of coronavirus, are seeing a renewed uh, interest uh, in how to get the uh, science out, get the um, you know uh, ideas of how to protect um, ourselves and also the basic epidemiology findings out in a way that's maximally funny, uh, in how I call it humor over rumor. If we can make humorous way to deliver these things, then everybody can think of even more humorous ways uh, to remind each other to keep physical distance and wash hands properly and so on. Um, and so I think this is not just Taiwan. Everybody is now well motivated uh, to reduce the R0 number of the virus mm -hmm. while increasing the R number of the social innovations of basic transmission rate of ID. Yes. I also found it quite interesting when you were discussing about the role of the public sector servant and some of the changes you've noticed in um, uh, the policy change allowing junior and younger public sector workers to express their ideas more freely, um, especially when um, using a pseudonym and in a in a sort of private forum, if you will. Well, not private. The yeah, uh, the but, but they get forum, recognized but... when the idea turns into reality. It's just mm -hmm. they remain pseudonymous during this incubation period to absorb the risk. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you were saying you were demonstrating it, then you would sort of take the risk as the demonstrator, but they could then express the idea and then perhaps take credit later on. Um, I know that there was the discussion that it's not um, something that is potentially such such a problem in the West. I do find it quite rare still to see in the West public sector workers like myself that openly um, work in the public service, but also get involved in other projects. So for example, as you know, I, I'm uh, working for the university, maybe I'm doing a teaching assistant job, I'm speaking to you and things like that. But it's not, I don't see a lot of overt activity from junior public service workers. Why do you think there's such a difference? I think in um, older um, democracies and republics, the people who are interested in public service need to understand the context of the public service. And they need to dedicate a lot of years to learn um, the proper kind of tradition in order to function well. Um, and that's um, as opposed to people who are interested in design thinking, in agile um, technologies, in uh, making a lot of uh, novel ideas in a ra very rapid iteration cycle that tend to be a different sort of people um, majoring in, in different things uh, in the universities. But in Taiwan, there's no legacy to, to speak of. And so um, the same generation of people are essentially all slashies, right? Uh, we uh, need to figure out how democracy work while we are also figuring out how to make personal computers work or how the World Web works or how social media works. Um, and so it tend to be uh, the same bunch of people. Um, and in 2014, the Sunflower Movement also showed that if you major in the humanities, if you are a social worker, uh, basically all walks of love at life, can offer their personal experiences and that uh, um, very meaningfully adds to the quality of the deliberation. And then it attracts people who are even of even softer skills to join the public service. So um, like in 2013, a year before Sunflower Movement, if you ask a random um, you know, a person uh, majoring in, in social work or majoring in other uh, people care skills, like uh, what are your prospects of your participating in public policy making, they will also tell you like it's not my business. But after mm -hmm. 2014, it became very cool uh, to, to share what they have to say. Uh, and I think the political climate uh, really changed because of the Occupy movement. Okay, and you also said very cool, so I'm, I'm changing the direction of the discussion a little bit. 
sometimes when events happen and when cultures change, we start to see changes in various places in that society. We, we have the zeitgeist, if you will, of what's happening there. And sometimes that manifests itself in art and in, in, other, in other media. Um, I, in, in preparing for this conversation, I, I discussed with uh, uh, someone close to me, actually, and we, we thought that perhaps when something becomes profound enough and important enough to a person, that person is able to express it creatively and in an art form, like you do with your manifesto, for example. Do you see versions of these changes in other places in society, such as in art or spirituality or other media? Definitely, definitely. Um, I'll share with you something that just went online yesterday. Uh, it's a hip hop group uh, <laughs> uh, called um, So Here, um, where they just uh, took one of my interviews with Japanese media and remixed it uh, as what they call a civil rap song. Amplifying. So you, you can you can pursue this um, later, but basically um, it's just taking the words that I've been sharing with you, uh, some of the uh, words that I've also shared with other um, press, um, and, and so this is their lyrics translated to, to English, uh, and they uh, basically reuse parts of my uh, conversation with uh, the journalists uh, like uh, location independence, like social sector, the civic sector. Um, we should own the data, building data collection and data collaboratives. Um, and uh, Henry George, uh, the Republic of Citizens, uh, and we're not transforming into digital, we're amplifying the analog process so it reaches more people. And these are some of the core ideas and they just wrote a, a rap, a hip hop um, to it and, and with experimental visuals uh, using a, uh, I think, machine learning to generate uh, meaningful uh, patterns uh, based on those words and so on and it was a, a hit I think <laughs> a lot of people joined in the premiere including me and so it is uh, really helping I guess the, the zeitgeist uh, to just experiment of how the traditional art and traditional art forms can help inform uh, the social innovation processes and and even the the thing that I wear, as you can see mm -hmm. with my uh, Facebook avatar photo, uh, is actually from the National Palace Museum, one of the, the most ancient Song Dynasty uh, paintings. Uh, and that was then given new uh, meanings and new forms uh, as a sign for social innovation. This um, is a my thank you note for Team Taiwan, because everybody uh, through a online data collaborative has uh, dedicated a lot of uh, medical masks to the international uh, people in need and people can see in real time, updated every day, uh, who are the people who dedicated their uncollected uh, facial mask um, uh, quota uh, into the world. And because we publish it as open data, so you can then see it being um, amplified uh, in other, uh, even more meaningful art forms, like this is from a professional designer, Aaron Ye, that says who can help, and then Taiwan. Uh, like walking uh, out of a, a, a door, uh, providing uh, safety and solidarity. And that combines our uh, previous Vice President Chen Jianren's crash course on coronavirus, on the timelines, on the specific technologies that we're helping. Uh, and then you can see this uh, humanitarian assistance, which is uh, reusing the, the look, um, data. And, and this is not government uh, work. This is entirely crowdfunded by a bunch of artists and YouTubers and, and things like that. So I think definitely this is getting into a uh, popular culture and it's very hip uh, to contributing whichever art form that you can uh, to the public welfare as you see here. Um, I'm just checking, was it only 40 minutes that we have? So do we have five minutes left? Something like that. Uh, but because we started late, so if you don't mind me eating at the same time, Not we have all. maybe maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, I don't mind that at all. Um, I had a chicken and egg question, although we've, we've kind of approached it, but more for the enjoyment of the question itself. Um, is technology disruptive or are people disruptive? Um, definitely, I think it's people who disrupt. But people can use technology to be more disruptive. Technology is an amplifier. If you choose to disrupt, the technology can make you more disruptive. Or if you choose to create, 
to nurture, uh, then the technology can also make it more nurturing. Uh, and so there is no technology that are neutral. Um, you tend to gravitate to a technology that agree with your philosophy. And this is the same with the society, with the social norms. Okay, and uh, something that I noticed in, in these conversations is that we don't really hear so much about bias or bias reports um, when, when we get to the technology that's, that's been used in the social sector. Can you tell me why that is? Yes, um, for example, the mass creationing uh, map, one of the most celebrated uh, piece of civic technology during the um, Taiwan response to the uh, pandemic is a good example because um, it starts quite biased. Um, the choose choice of map as a visualization to show you which pharmacy near you still have the mask. And once you get there, you purchase the mask nine every two weeks if you're an adult, 10 if you're a child, um, and you can see it um, decrease in real time so that people hold each other accountable. This is obviously biased because people who don't have uh, sight, who people with blindness, uh, cannot make use of this map um, that well. Uh, and the reason why the bias is not so much discussed is because this is open innovation. Anyone can take this and build a chatbot. Uh, and so people did that actually on the very first day, noticing that people with blindness cannot build the mask uh, map. They just build a chatbot using the line system. Later on, uh, people in Trend Micro, one of the leading antivirus company, would contribute the voice assistant plugin. And eventually, Apple's Siri team um, joined in. And so if you ask Siri, where are the masks, they will just in, you know, refer you uh, to these uh, voice-enabled parts of the more than 100 tools. So if you begin with the idea of open innovation and the first uh, movers do not preclude further possibilities from happening, then you don't need to worry that much about bias because people who are suffering from a disadvantage uh, viewpoint can always find people who sympathize with them and then complete their piece of the puzzle uh, without um, you know, taking down anything before them. But if you do not have an open innovation, if you rely on traditional procurement rules, then of course you have to be very wary of uh, bias because you cannot co co correct that course uh, until one year later in the procurement cycle. Okay, yes, and the procurement cycle is always uh, more complex and requires a slower moving ec ecosystem than right, perhaps right, right. Right. collaboration. So innovation is social sector defining the spec, and we in the public sector deliver our support. So this is a reverse procurement, and it doesn't suffer from the same problem uh, as uh, the traditional way of PPP. Okay, and uh, just finally, uh, there was a question at some point uh, about how you see things changing in the future. And one part of the answer you gave was related to how psychological proximity would be enhanced by the technologies we're using at the moment. Can you tell me a bit more about that in the context we've been discussing? Mm -hmm. Well, this is evident, right? If you are also, you know, having food as I'm having food now, <laughs> we'll feel <laughs> more proximity um, than compared to if we meet face to face, but each have to wear a mask and therefore cannot read each other's expressions. Ah, uh, here we go. So, <laughs> right. so um, what we're trying to say is that um, the coronavirus not only let us see the possibility of a more uh, environmental friendly lifestyle, as everybody has been pointing out nowadays, but also shows how social solidarity can be built by people in very different time zones with very different time um, life experiences, but will still enjoy, you know, warm water, <laughs> I assume, <laughs> or cold water uh, and um, good food, uh, and also music, uh, the, like the rap I just shared to you, um, and also just the, the care that we put into the global health um, community. And those um, solidarity are from uh, what we traditionally call a swift trust, right? We, we just trust each other to care about the same things. And so we hop on Skype and have an interview and we agree to even record it and publish to YouTube um, or uh, publish to say it as a transcript. Uh, and all this <coughs> shows that we care about um, other people. We care not only about our own selfish 
interest, but actually about the future generations, including anyone who happened to read this transcript. And, and so this basically is a uh, more um, sustainable way of looking at uh, personal relationship if we join mostly communities of practice instead of communities of physical uh, proximity, then we bring the better part of ourselves out in more of our day-to-day -day communications. And I, I make an example of working in a public park, right? So, so if you uh, see out of the window, you see those people playing basketball, holding uh, press conferences around protecting birds while erecting uh, the wind uh, power plants, uh, offshore wind uh, power panels and things like that. So, so I feel people care about the society environment much more if I work in the open uh, rather than if I work in isolated cubicles uh, in a ministerial office. Okay, um, I think that that pretty much answers all my questions and uh, hopefully gives you a couple more minutes of eating um, without interruption okay. as well. That's great, that's great. So would you prefer a transcript uh, or a video published? Um, I would be fine with both, to be oh, honest. Okay, I, okay. I will leave that decision. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll just publish the video to YouTube, and YouTube will make a caption for us. Uh, and if you see something wrong with the caption, you can always contribute uh, as a YouTube uh, community member. Okay, certainly. Okay, let's do that. Okay, cheers. Very Thank good you so much for your time. Good question. Thank you. Okay, cheers. <laughs> bye bye. bye.